Now, damn it, before I talk about impact this week, we got a job to do, people. Ten to go. Ten to go. Go to the Oterra Central Store, Pro Wrestling Tees, and hashtag buy a shirt. If you want me to have to buy that four-disc Best of Jeff Jarrett TNA DVD set, watch all 16 hours of it. 16 hours of it. And then have to come on here and review it as part of the Retro Wrestling Review Series. And you go to the Oterra Central Store at Pro Wrestling Tees and hashtag buy a shirt. Only need to do 10 more by the end of September. And remember, all net proceeds, whatever there are from this shirt sale in September, will go to hurricane relief efforts somehow, some way. We can figure out the logistics of that later. And I'm also matching it 100%. So do something for a good cause. And all of the while, do something that will aggravate the ever-loving piss out of me, which I'm sure a lot of you will get your jollies off too. So bottom line is, hashtag buy a shirt. It's the fun thing to do, people. Five of them are already gone. Ten more to go. All proceeds to help hurricane victims. Let's do this, all right? Anyways, let's get on to the business at hand. Impact Wrestling for this week. I will say this. Is having the TV set up where I can watch both Impact and Thursday Night Football. I will say my eyes actually gravitated much more towards impact this week than Thursday Night Football. Now, that might be more of an indictment of the piss-poor quality of play that we saw in that Thursday night game between the Texans and the Bengals, and that's probably a big part of it. But for the night, for me, from an interest-level standpoint, impact wrestling still had the edge. I don't know that this says a whole lot, but it is what it is. Uh, you start off with Braxton taking on Garza Jr. And I look at Garza Jr. and I'm like, you know, I could envision the ladies really like this guy. Like, they should be packaging him as some type of Latino Heat 2.0 type of figure. Like, he should be a ladies' man. He should be making the ladies swoon. And he'd probably really do a great job of it as a heel. But even as a baby face, he could kind of be a ladies' man. But as I'm looking at this match, I'm, I, I can't remember if I missed something. But why is this match happening? Why should I care? I don't have a problem with the show starting off with a match, but to me, if you're going to start off a match with a wrestling show, it should have some type of purpose or meaning or significance for it actually happening. And I don't remember there really being much story between these two guys. I don't really remember there being much of a reason, and I don't know if they really gave us one. Just kind of a random match. I don't really think you should be starting off a wrestling show with a random wrestling match. But if you are, it should be established star versus uh, underneath guy, if you're going to do anything like that. Um, but then the next match we had made some sense. And this, I felt like, almost should have opened if you were going to do this match here. El Hijo de, del Fantasma, whatever the fuck, versus Ethan Carter the third for the Grand Championship. If you're going to do this, let's do this as the opener to the show. Because at least then, because it is a title match, it has purpose, reason, and significance. And you'd actually talked about this match was going to happen previously. Uh, again, with the Impact Grand Championship, I appreciate and applaud the effort to be different, the effort to try and incorporate something from somewhere else. With that said, I'm not a particularly big fan of the concept because wrestling doesn't know how to do this type of shit right, and they will ultimately book it in a repetitive manner. And you see it almost every single time. One guy wins round one, one guy wins round two, and pretty much every time it goes to the judges' scorecards. And that's just not the way fights work. There's so many other ways you should do this. Sometimes a guy should win almost instantaneously. Knock a guy out. Have a referee have to stop it somewhere along the way. You should have a guy win the first two rounds. You should have a guy win all three rounds. You should have it, in a lot of cases, not go to the judges. But it seems like every single time it follows this kind of repetitive format. And this is an example of wrestling trying to take something from somewhere else, whether you want to call it MMA or boxing. Either way, you're borrowing from both but not understanding how it works and not understanding how it really plays out in those worlds and trying to put a wrestling spin on it and making it boring, bland, and predictable. I will say this, as this match was going on, there was an innate fascination to me because I look and there's Dutch Mantel, there's Scott Damore, and I'm like, who the fuck is the guy with the gray hair that is not Bruce Pritchard? As I continue to look, and I continue to look, before they finally acknowledged who it was, I said, man, is that the gobbledygooker? Is that Hector Guerrero? 
That dude with the fucking gray hair that looked like 100 years old was fucking Hector Guerrero. I had legitimately no idea at first who the hell that was. What happened to him? Like, that was the biggest fascination out of this man. And it was a fascination. It was like, what the hell? And even once I realized it was Hector Guerrero, I still didn't want to believe that this was the fucking gobbledygooker, that this was Hector Guerrero. And it ultimately was Hector Guerrero. It was kind of like a weird pop type of moment. Like, oh my God, there's Hector Guerrero. But on the flip side, oh my God, what happened to Hector Guerrero? Anyways, the, ma the match again, because it falls into kind of that pathetically repeatable pattern of how they tend to book this, I'm not a big fan of. This should have been something different. You know, especially since Phantasma's not on the roster. It should be EC3 get winning via ref stoppage or a uh, pinfall or knocking the guy out or disqualification or something like that. There has to be some type of different finish than literally it seems like what they do every single damn time. It comes down to the judges' scorecards. Uh, so we got OVE versus LAX, but it really wasn't. It was a, a fatal four-way tag match. Why would LAX want to face three other teams to defend their titles? What in the actual fuck? It's one thing to have a title shot shown on another promotion. That's stupid enough. But then we didn't even, I don't, they got anywhere close to the full match. We basically just got a highlight package. So we treat our product so inferiorly that we're emphasizing a promotion in Tijuana in another country and only bothering to show the highlights of that. It's just fucking dumb. If this is what you were going to do, then you shouldn't have fucking done it. I cannot believe that they didn't book an actual tag title match there in the impact zone on this episode. And doing this, I thought, was inexcusable and just a fucking joke. But speaking of jokes, nothing gets worse than everything that involves Grado. And, and as this whole thing played out, after his match against Willie Weeks, Grado's sitting there and giving his big goodbye, and I, along with Fool Killer and I'm sure many others, could feel the vomit uh, being produced in our throat region. Joseph Park comes out, and oh my God, he's had a eureka moment, a revelation, he's here to save the day. Park, Park, and Park have gotten into the sports management business. And at least I felt good when I saw a fool killer tweet about this because I thought I was the only one that remembered that the fucking law firm was imaginary. It was all inside of Joseph Park's head. Joseph Park is not actually an attorney. And it just, at least somebody else remembered this. Now, granted, that was a few years ago. We could talk about continuity matters, except in Impact Wrestling, but it was a couple of years ago, and, and I'll forgive that. But if this is where we were going to go, why in the fuck didn't we just do this from the jump? Unless you're going to tell me we're going to get to that point where we realize it's not actually a law firm and Grado's still in trouble, then at that point, why must this story continue? And ultimately, Joseph Park is the one to save Grado and keep him here in the States, but not in the way marriage that would have actually mattered, that would have gotten this company a whole lot of attention that frankly at this point in time they absolutely fucking need. Why again did we need to involve the Laurel Van Ness character in any of this? And based off of the way all of this played out, why are these two fucks not the two biggest fucking heels on the roster? This has been dumb. This has been terrible on so many different levels. And the quicker it ends and the quicker they all fucking go away, the better for me. At least, after this, I got what was a very good X Division title match, Falls Count Anywhere. And while I usually knock the company for overdoing the special match stipulations, extreme rules, you know, street fights, uh, Monsters Ball matches, Falls Count Anywhere, all this other crap. And they do it all the time. This company does that shit way too much. I will say, at least this match lived up to the stipulation. I had a lot of fun watching this. This was my highlight of the week. And as I'm watching it, I'm like, you know what? I realize another company did it over a decade and a half ago with their hardcore title, so it wouldn't be truly original. But goddamn, this product needs something different. And for them, it would be different. I would be completely and totally fine with a 24-7 rules for the X Division title. As you could pre-record this shit, you could do all types of crazy things. You could have guys doing freaking 450s off of tree branches and in parks, and you're fighting on merry-go-rounds. You're fighting in malls. You're doing all this other stuff the WWE used to do in tune, different things with it. You could sit there and battle on fucking jet skis. I don't fucking know. 
You could do all this other crap. You could fight in rental cars. You could fight throughout Universal Studios. Why the hell not? Do it at night and shit. Tell the park we need it. And fucking film them fighting on Ferris wheels or whatever the hell they have at Universal Studios. That would be something that would provide, to me anyways, a major injection of life both into this X Division and frankly the company as a whole and the Impact product as a whole. That would be a lot of fucking fun. And at this point in time, if anything else, let's at least have Impact Wrestling give us some fun. And 24-7 rules for the X Division is something I would be completely and totally on board with. And I think with the logistics of them trying to record multiple months of television at the same time, they could get so much shit and so much content. And they wouldn't even, they would hardly even have to show up to the freaking arena. They could do so many different crazy things. This would be a case where 24-7 rules, if these guys are making independent appearances, then you could sit there and show stuff from the independent shows. You could do all this other crap. I think it would be fucking awesome. I'd totally be on board with it. Hashtag 247X Division. Let's make it happen. A tie of Valkyrie. And yes, it's Taya, not Tara. Um, I liked her match with Amber Nova in the sense that she was beating her up and beating her up. And then she had her clearly beat, but she wasn't satisfied with that. She pulled her up because she wanted to beat her up some more. Cool. Physical bitch. With a big old booty. Wants to fuck this bitch up some more. I'm like, that's how a monster should do things. It's not just about the pinfall. It's not just about the victory. It's about the manner. It's about the message sent. It's about all of that. And I thought that was really well done. But I did not understand why Rosemary didn't make an appearance at all. I mean, you could sit there and say, yeah, selling the beatdown, selling the beatdown, whatever the hell else. But it's just kind of odd. Maybe you would have had Rosemary or somebody else come out. Just a thought. Um... But of course, we've got to do the thing with the horse face and everything else. But we'll move on from that. Uh, the number one contenders match, low key, uh, Johnny Impact. I didn't think was all that particularly good. I also don't understand, and correct me if I'm wrong. I don't remember there was anything specifically said that LAX was specifically banned from ringside. Why in the fuck wouldn't LAX want to get involved here? Like you're just going to sit there and play the white privilege card, and you're going to complain about this and that. Why wouldn't you do everything you possibly could to help your guy get the shot here? So LAX is basically just a bunch of whiny bitches that when it comes time for it, they don't step up and actually do anything to change the result. Just stupid to me. But in that case, you've got Johnny Impact versus Eli Drake in a couple of weeks at, what is it, uh, Victory Road for the Global Championship. Cool, whatever. We'll move on. But this show ultimately was about Bobby Lashley and him saying goodbye. Now I'm all for Bobby Lashley versus Moose at Bound for Glory. Fucking A right. The black man main event, FTW. But with that said, the whole premise of him asking for his release from his contract is fucking stupid. He's got to choose one. Why now all of a sudden would he fucking have to choose one? Furthermore, why would Jim Cornette just sit there and release him from his contract? Why wouldn't he just fucking fire him to send a message? Why wouldn't he suspend him and make it fucking worse? Why wouldn't he sit there? And I don't know. Not allow America top team to fucking come in the building to begin with and then just basically walk around like they fucking own the joint. This is private property. Nobody says that they have to be there. Well, Bobby Lashley, okay, Bobby Lashley's allowed and all of them are banned. And if Lashley doesn't like it, then he can stay home. And he's suspended. The whole premise of this is just fundamentally so fucking stupid. And then as America top team beats people up backstage... Comes into Jim Cornette's office like they own the place. So, of course, we're making wrestling look stupid by allowing MMA to walk around like they're the biggest, baddest bullies on the fucking block. Then when they come out and they all start jumping on Moose and they all start beating Moose down, where the fuck is the rest of the Global Force wrestling roster to come out and fuck up these wannabe MMA tough guys? You want to know what I really don't fundamentally like about this fucking shit? Is how wrestling continues to kiss MMA's ass like MMA is fucking perfect. Fuck MMA. Most everything that MMA does that's successful, they've ultimately ripped off for professional wrestling for fuck them. And let's stop fucking making MMA look like it's more legitimate than professional wrestling. Let's stop making MMA look like it's more important and more serious than professional wrestling. And most importantly of all, Global Force Wrestling. Stop making Global Force Wrestling look stupid. Fucking dumb. But anyways, 
Ask the review this week. Let me know what you thought of the show and the review in the comments below. I'm the Slag Daddy. This is OTRS Central. Remember, it's not the wrestling show you want, just the wrestling show you need.